Good morning. All righty. So uh, thanks. Whoop. All right. It's okay. Are you all right back there? So uh, welcome to the Advanced PowerShell Module Development with Visual Studio Code Talk. Uh, I'm David Wilson. I am a senior software engineer uh, in the PowerShell team at Microsoft. And I've been working on the PowerShell extension for VS Code for almost two years now. It's kind of hard to believe, but uh, uh, it's been a pretty awesome journey to sort of go from beginning to where we are now. Lots of things have been changing in the past few months. So um, part of the reason for having this talk today is to show you some of the new things that we're capable of doing with PowerShell development in uh, VS Code and how that applies directly to module development. So uh, just to get like a show of hands, uh, how many people have actually used uh, VS Code so far for PowerShell? Yeah, are you guys using it like as your main development environment? How many people are using it as their main development environment now? So yeah, not quite as many. And a lot of people still using the PowerShell ISC. Yeah, so a lot of ISC users. And how many of you are still using the ISC because Tobias is a genius and uh, ISC steroids is really good? Yeah, so probably the major majority of you, yeah, all right. Well, uh, today we'll show you some things in uh, VS Code that um, are probably sort of a little bit unique in terms of uh, what you have been able to do in uh, PowerShell editors in the past. Um, so maybe it'll inspire you to try it again uh, if you haven't been using it for a while. So the agenda, uh, we're gonna show a variety of different things that are all sort of related to module development. Uh, first, we'll create a module with Plaster. Um, then we'll show a little bit about how to write and navigate code in the editor. <clears throat> then we'll show how to debug a module in the integrated console, and then do some uh, development and debugging of pester tests, and then also show how to do some PS script analyzer configuration so that you have markers in your code for various things. Uh, script formatting, um, then a little bit of investigation into how you can um, write and debug cross-platform binary modules. So, first of all, um, how many people have heard of Plaster? Okay, so uh, for those who don't know what Plaster is, it's a project that Keith, and I, Keith Hill and I started last year uh, with the intent of providing a uh, PowerShell module that can create other PowerShell modules from templates. Uh, and this is kind of useful when you start to do like more like structured module development and you want to start from a good basics, basis for your module. So to have like uh, pester tests and uh, editor configuration and um, your basic sort of code structure, maybe a basic build script. Um, Plaster is a tool that allows you to create new projects uh, using some of these, uh, these features. Uh, the other nice thing is that you can create your own custom templates with Plaster. So if you have sort of your own module development process internally, like in your company, you can create your own company template for making uh, PowerShell modules and, and anyone who's creating a new module in your company can use your, your custom template for, for creation. So it allows you to enforce some module development standards um, for any new projects that are created. So we uh, integrated Plaster into VS Code, allowing you to create a new project from within the editor. So I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So I'm in a blank uh, workspace right now. There's nothing open currently. I'm gonna use Control Shift P to open the command palette. And uh, just to describe like what this is, um, the command palette is basically every action you can possibly take in VS Code. Um, so this is probably the primary place you wanna go for finding out how to do stuff in the editor. Um, you have this entire list of actions. You can see the, uh, the shortcut keys for some of the actions, and you can also type to interactively search for uh, commands. So I'm gonna type uh, new project, and you can see that we have PowerShell create new project from Plaster template. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Is that better? What about people in the back? Can, can you read that? No, all right. Let me just change the theme also. Whoops. All right, let me just start that over, all right. All right, is that better or is that blinding you now? All right, so let me try that one more time. So, uh, new project. All right, so 
when you run this command, uh, you'll see that um, it gives you the option for creating a new PowerShell manifest module. And this is a template that's built in the plaster. It's very basic, uh, doesn't really have much to it, just allows you to create some, some pester tests and uh, general module structure. Um, we have another advanced module template that we're working on, but uh, after some feedback from the community, we sort of like held off on that for a bit because we needed to take some, uh, some time to do it the right way. But uh, for now, we have this one built-in template. And now you can also see that uh, there is this uh, option for loading additional templates from installed modules. So one of the other features of Plaster is that um, you can make your own custom templates and ship them as part of a uh, PowerShell gallery module. And then if they're installed on the PS module path, then you'll be able to get a list of those templates in the editor. So uh, if you have your own custom templates and you have like a private gallery, you can ship those to the private gallery. And so long as um, uh, your uh, developers have installed the templates on their machine, then they should show up in this list. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just run the, the new template. And the first thing it does is ask me like for a folder path. Where should I create the, uh, the new project? So I'll go ahead and say like uh, my first module. And unfortunately, they don't give me an API in VS Code to show a folder browser. So I can't actually show like a folder selection dialog yet. Um, I've got an, an issue open in the VS Code repo asking for this. And if they don't add it, I'll probably just go add it myself. But uh, for now, you have to type in the path, which is a little in inconvenient, but uh, it's, it's doable. So if I press enter, you can see the plaster gets launched in the integrated console. And uh, first of all, it asks you, it starts prompting you for things that are re relevant to the template. Um, so it says, enter the name of the module. So I'll say my first module. Now it asks me for the version number of the module. I can put in any initial version number that I want, like 1.0, but since this is a new module, I'll just stick with the default 0.1.0. Then it asks me if, it, if I want to create a test directory and add pester tests. Uh, I could say no, and it would not create pester tests, but uh, since we want to have a good example, I'll say yes, which is the default. Um, also ask me if I want to uh, select an editor for editor integration. Um, so some editors, like Visual Studio Code, have files that can be in your project folder that sort of drive how the editor um, enables features for your project. Uh, so the .vs code folder in your uh, project folder is uh, one example of this. Uh, VS code, sorry, Visual Studio also has some of its own files and maybe other editors have uh, their own configura configuration files as well. So um, right now we only support VS code, but we could add support for other editors if it made sense. So I'm gonna select uh, C because that's the option for VS code. And now it says it is scaffolding my module. And as soon as the scaffolding is complete, it uh, pops up a new window with the, the new project. And if you want to look at the output here, it tells us basically what files that it created and gives us some, some message output from the template to uh, tell us what happened. Yeah, um, uh, Stefan's asking if uh, it would be nice to have an option to create a Git repo for the project. Yes, we've been asked about that before. Um, we haven't added a way to do that yet, but uh, it definitely makes sense. I mean, we'd, we'd want to initialize a Git repo for the project and do like an initial commit or something. So that's something we can add in the future. So now let's check out this uh, new project that got created. Uh, we see we have a PSM1 file, a PSD1 file, a test folder path. The PSM1 file doesn't really have anything other than just uh, export module member uh, command for exporting all the functions. Um, and then we have the PSD1 file that has all the uh, parameters filled in based on what we've typed into the template parameters. Um, so our module version, and it automatically wires up the PSM1 file, et cetera. And we have our test file, which just has some basic pester tests for validating that the module manifest is loadable in PowerShell. And we also have the .vs code folder that has um, some initial settings um, and the task.json file. Um, so it's just basic project setup so that you can get started really fast. Um, and uh, yeah, later we'll add more templates that have more advanced functionality for like doing binary module development um, and maybe like DSC resources. I think we have like an example DSC resource template, but we don't have it uh, shipped with a default distribution. Uh, if you're interested in how to write Plaster templates, uh, we have a lot of documentation on the uh, Plaster repo. And this may be hard to see because I have a black background on GitHub. Um, but uh, there's an examples folder in the Plaster repo, and there's also a documentation folder that has um, a full 
uh, about page for creating a plaster manifest and how, basically how to write a template. So definitely take a look at that if you're interested at all in templating PowerShell projects. Um, uh, one other thing to mention here is that uh, if you've ever used this command for creating a project in VS Code in the past, uh, you probably saw that it used the little UI pop-ups for prompting for some of the, the options. Um, this went away recently when, with the advent of the integrated console, but I'm going to add it back soon so that you have more of like an integrated experience for uh, entering parameters instead of to having to type them all into the console, because it's a little bit weird to do that, but that's all coming back soon. So uh, let's look into writing and navigating code. Um, to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to pop open the, uh, the Plaster project code base so we can see like an actual project. And uh, let me close some of these tabs actually. Okay. Man, this is hard to view with it zoomed in so, so far. So um, we have, you know, just a normal code base. Um, you know, you can get IntelliSense if you are typing into the editor. It's pretty fast. You type like git process and it gives you the, all the commands um, that are available in the system. You also see that you have information about the parameters that are available in the, in the command. If I go ahead and type uh, git process dash, you can see that we get this little pop-up that gives you the parameter sets for the command. Uh, so you can kind of navigate through those to see what parameter sets are available. Um, and you get uh, completion for the parameters themselves. So you can see that it actually completed Chrome for the name here. So it, uh, any uh, command that has arguments with argument completers or uh, any dynamic parameters or anything, those will also automatically get populated here. Um, especially if you like to write your own argument completers using tab, expan tab expansion plus plus or the new APIs in PowerShell v5 that do basically the same thing, um, you can have your own custom completions showing up in the editor. Uh, Trevor Sullivan did a really cool lightning demo of this at the PowerShell Summit in North America where he was interactively developing a command completer or argument completer and showing it being used in the editor at the same time, which is pretty awesome. So it's, it's pretty nice to have that capability of adding you know, custom completions to your commands. Any questions on that so far? So um, another thing that's really useful for getting around in a code base that you're not familiar with. Like if you download the code for a module like Plaster or some other community project, you don't really know what's in there and you may be sort of intimidated by the amount of code that's there. Uh, VS Code has some nice features for code navigation. Um, so like if you have a file that has a bunch of, bunch of functions, like this file has, you know, this, I think this file is possibly even about a thousand lines, which is really long and there's a lot of stuff in it. So, you know, there's not really, not an easy way just looking at the code to digest what's in the, in the file. But uh, we can use the, the document symbols feature by pressing control shift O. And this gives us a drop down list of all the functions that are defined in the file, even if the functions are nested within another function. So if I start using the arrow keys to navigate through this list, you can see that the editor is jumping to the location where those functions are in the file. And if I go down to like this function and press enter, then it just sends me there to that location. Uh, similarly, if you have um, another, or if you have multiple files open in the workspace, you can search across any of those files in the workspace by using control T, which gives you uh, workspace level symbol searching. So I can search for uh, get plaster template, and then it shows me that function. So it's really easy to find uh, functions that are defined in other files in the module. Uh, right now, the caveat is that you have to have those files open before they're searchable, but uh, in the very near future, we'll have it set up so that for any file within the workspace path that you have open, uh, you'll get all the symbols searchable. Also, it's nice to be able to um, like find definitions of uh, commands or finding references to commands. So let's say this get error location file attribute value function, you're like, okay, this is cool, this function exists, but where is it being used? Um, you can hit uh, shift F12, and it will give you this little pop-up that um, gives you the two occurrences of where this function is being used in this file. Um, it also will traverse other files that are using it uh, in the workspace. So if you jump to this location, uh, imagine if you saw this function at this part of the code, uh, you're like, okay, I want to see what this function actually does. So you can just hit F12, and it will jump to the definition of that function. 
So you have you know bidirectional navigation between uh, functions and variables defined in your in your module. Uh, right now, the implementation of this is pretty naive um, and simple. Um, initially, what we had over the past year is if you have a script file that dot sources another script file, we were able to traverse that relationship between the files and go to uh, functions that are functions or variables defined in another file through that uh, dot sourcing reference. But uh, when Yep, seven. Yeah, classes aren't supported yet because um, the way that we are doing our uh, syntax parsing, we haven't found a good way to uh, load the uh, ASC visitor that only works on PowerShell v5 because classes didn't exist before then. So there's there's just like some .NET limitations we have to get around, uh, but that's coming very soon. Um, but uh, we have a new implementation of the uh, go to definition and find references stuff that actually uses, um, it scans all the PS1 and PSM1 files inside of the workspace and then lets you navigate between them. But if you think about that for a minute, you're like, well, I don't necessarily want it to just find any function name to get error location file, whatever, across the workspace. I and mean, maybe I don't want it to look for files in my release folder. Like maybe if you compile your code into a release folder that's inside of your workspace, you don't want it to look in those, those folders. Certain things like that we're going to have to add over time, but the impetus would be uh, right now to release functionality that's going to work for people and provide value and then get feedback from the community about what needs to be improved and what problems you run into so that we can really quickly iterate on that design and make it better. Chris? Uh, like to, to go back to the previous part? Uh, F12, or actually that allows me to, to go to the definition. However, um, that's a good question because there's this go menu and uh, if you sort of navigate around your code files or switch between files, there is a back and forward feature that allows you to jump back to where you were previously. So it's, it's more of a, an editor level thing which uh, allows you to do that. So. If you just want to go back to where you were previously, it, it works for that. I think the hotkey is alt left arrow, left arrow to go back in, uh, in your cursor history. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, any other questions so far on that? All right. Oh, and one other thing. Uh, a lot of people ask, uh, when you're developing a module and you have, uh, you know, a bunch of files in your module, um, if you're getting IntelliSense results, um, it makes sense that you would get IntelliSense results for other functions that are, or sorry, functions that are defined in other files in your project. Uh, but right now you don't get that because PowerShell's completion engine just gives you completions for anything that's been loaded, loaded into the current session. So there's no way to get completions for functions in the module other than just loading the module and then having the functions be loaded into the session and then getting completions for those. Uh, one thing that I would like to add is the ability to generate completions for files that haven't been loaded into the session yet. So we basically just scan the AST of the script files and build completion information um, so that you get those completions before any of those scripts were loaded. So that should come probably later this year sometime, but uh, I think it'd be really helpful for module, module development. So uh, debugging a module with the console. So. Uh, has anybody had a chance to try out the integrated console in, uh, in VS Code yet? Yeah, so this is a new thing that came probably two or three months ago. And uh, it basically gives us a similar type of uh, inter inter interactive console experience that you get in the ISC, where you have this you know, persistent console that is connected, connected to the editing experience and allows you to uh, run code in the, uh, from the editor into the console and then have things that you do in the console affect the editor uh, similarly. Um, so this is really good for debugging because it allows you to set breakpoints in a module and then run, load that module and run functions in the module and then be able to debug your module as it's being used. Um, in the past, the only way you could uh, debug a module in VS Code was have some script on the side that loads your module and then invokes whatever functions you were interested in, then you have to run that script to debug your module, which is not the greatest experience because it sort of limits you to, you know, putting uh, your debug functionality into a script rather than just doing it uh, interactively in the console. So uh, let's try to set a breakpoint in this get plaster template function. So I'll go down into the process block and set a breakpoint here on line 65. And uh, one thing to note here is um, in the ISE, 
the, the general behavior is if you set a breakpoint in a file and then you go into the console and run the function that's defined in that file, um, when the breakpoint gets hit in PowerShell, the debugger UI gets uh, activated inside of the ISC. In VS Code, we don't have that functionality just yet. Um, if I was to try to run this code right now, the breakpoint wouldn't get hit because uh, VS Code's debugger model is that um, you can set breakpoints in the UI, but they don't get activated in the run space until you initiate debugging. So it's a little bit limited. Uh, there's, there's no persistent connection between the debugger interface in VS Code to the uh, PowerShell session. Um, hopefully they'll change that in the future. But for now, you have to initiate debugging first before you'll be able to hit any breakpoints. Um, so what I'll do is uh, go and open the debugger pane and select the PowerShell interactive session debugging mode. By default, the debugger in VS Code for PowerShell uh, will debug the current script file, but if you want to have uh, console-based debugging, you need to use this interactive session configuration. Um, and I guess this is a good point to explain how configurations work for VS Code. Um, for a given language, there is uh, a set of configurations for debugging. And those get cre created the first time you try to debug a script in VS Code. So it creates this .vs code slash launch.json file. This is a simple JSON file that has some configuration settings for different um, PowerShell debugging configurations. And the interactive session is one of the defaults. So if you ever try to debug a PowerShell script, uh, VS Code will automatically generate this file. And uh, you, then you'll have these, these uh, configurations available. But you'll have to go into this debugger menu and select the interactive session because it's not the default. So if I hit F5 here, you'll see that the status bar turns orange, indicating that we're in debug mode now. And uh, what I'll do is, um, I, actually, I'll check and make sure that we have a breakpoint set. So get PS breakpoint. Yeah, so we have uh, two breakpoints set, one in line nine. I don't know why that's there. Oh, that's a different file. Okay. So um, I'll go ahead and load up the module. And then I'll run git plaster template. And it hits the breakpoint here. And now we're able to debug this function. Um, you can hover over variables to see their current values. You can use F11 to step in or step, basically step through your code. Um, it's pretty useful. And uh, also, if you haven't used uh, the debugger in VS Code before, it has this really nice variables window where you can dig into variables that are available in the session currently. Um, you can look into objects, so you can dig through uh, properties within objects, or you can look into uh, collections, which is pretty useful. So uh, that's a pretty interesting feature. You can also set watch variables, so if you have like a loop and you want to see what uh, the current value of a given variable is while you're stepping through the loop, you can set a watch just by right-clicking on a variable and clicking set value. So that's pretty useful for debugging. And uh, I think that's it for that. Um, one other thing you can do is debug the loading of your module. So if I go into the, uh, the PSM1 file, cluster.psm1, and I scroll down a bit, I'll set a breakpoint here on line 81. Let me, whoop, let me go ahead and remove the module from the session. And I'll start the debugger again with F5. Now I'll import the module. And now you see that uh, the PSM1 file gets hit uh, in the debugger while the module's being loaded. So it's helpful for debugging the startup of your module if you have like um, some logic that loads the scripts that are in your module folder or does any other kind of initialization. So it could be pretty useful for that. So uh, any questions on debugging so far? Uh, anything that you feel it might be missing from this compared to your experience with ISC or PowerShell Studio or other editors, anything like that? Yeah, so um, the way that this file works is that uh, the PowerShell extension defines what the possible de debugging configurations are for PowerShell debugging. Um, we have our own parameters that are specified for um, PowerShell debugging. I think this is actually out of date. This should be script. But um, usually you're debugging a specific script file. 
uh, but you can leave the script parameter out if you just want the interactive session uh, debugging mode where you're basically not running a script, you just want it to turn debug mode on. You can also specify arguments to your scripts, so you can run a script with specific arguments. It's also kind of nice because you can create multiple configurations for running the same script just with different arguments if you have different ways you want to test the script in the debugger. Um, you can also run a script here in the script line, like actual code. You can say invoke uh, pester or something like that in this, in this line. And that actually comes into play with um, the pester test debugging, which I'll show a little bit later. It basically just invokes pester here in the script line. So uh, it's kind of useful. It gives you some flexibility on how you configure debugging for your session. So uh, is that pretty helpful? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, we're now down to running and debugging pester tests. So um, this is a good point to talk about uh, VS Code's task system. So uh, as is common in VS Code, everything is configured using JSON files. And for your specific workspace, you can have this task.json file that um, basically defines what tasks you might want to have in your development workflow, like building your code or testing your code or publishing your code, um, anything like that that you would normally do. Uh, it's really helpful if you have a build script um, that has different tasks in the build script. You can basically write a, a simple task.json file that maps to the tasks that you have in your build script so that you can list them and run them from within VS Code. Um, hopefully in the future they'll give us the, uh, the ability to dynamically register tasks in the editor so that uh, if you have a build script and we can get the list of tasks from the build script, we can dynamically populate that list so that you never have to even configure this. But for now you have to do a little bit of manual work to, to set it up. Um, so the components of this are um, primarily you have a program that you're going to be running. So every task in, um, in VS Code expects to run some console application to, to perform the functionality. In our case, we're going to run PowerShell because PowerShell has everything we, we could possibly need for that. So uh, you can specify platform-specific paths. So since we support Linux and OS X, uh, we have paths configured for the default PowerShell location on uh, those OSs. And um, you can also specify the, the parameters to be passed to the application just sort of at a high level so that um, like if you want to set execution policy to bypass uh, or not load your profile when running tasks. And then you have the list of tasks that you're configuring for your session. Sure. Um, you can specify the individual tasks that you want to have available in your workspace. Uh, right now, we have like a clean task and a build task and tests and uh, building the help files and all sorts of stuff. So you can do all those things from within the editor. And what they basically do is just tell PowerShell to run certain commands. So we just pass along PowerShell script to, uh, uh, to PowerShell to, to have it run these tasks. And really all we're doing is just invoking Sake. So we're using Sake as our, our build script runner for the, the uh, Plaster project. So we're just calling it invoke Sake with a, our build script and just telling it what task we want to run. So we're deferring all the uh, build behavior down to Sake and then it takes care of everything else. So um, I think this is a really effective way to configure tasks for the editor. They allow you to use any tool that you need. Uh, most uh, programming language communities have their own um, command line tools for doing a lot of the build tasks. So um, there's no point in the editor having their own implementations for everything. We can just kind of shell out to uh, a process for that. Yep. Um, I think we had one, did we? Oh, or maybe not. Let's see, we have the window, oh, we had the window open. Uh, I think we have one task maybe there, but if we don't, then we should add some. But the, for the, uh, yeah, we have a test task. I should have shown that. I forgot about that. All right, I'll show it now. Um, but we need to have a build script in the default plaster templates before, you know, more tasks make sense there because otherwise we don't really have anything we can do other than just run in the code. But uh, yeah, so when we generate a new project using plaster, we'll have, you know, the associated task for whatever is available in the module. Um, so let me just show you how you can run these tasks. So if you hit Control shift p to open the command palette and type in task, you'll see there are a few tasks that are, or a few task commands that are available. Uh, at the highest level, you have the run task command, and if you run that, you'll get a list of all the, the tasks that you've defined in this task.json file. There's also um, the run build task command and run test task command, and those are just shortcuts to get to your build and test tasks 
And if you set your um, one of your tasks that say is build command to true, then that's the one that gets wired up to that command. Same thing for tests. You have this uh, test task is test command true that will be wired up as the test task. So if I want to run that from here, I can say run, run test task. And this will run, whoops, actually I don't want to show that yet. That will run the uh, pester tests. Let me reload the window. That will run the pester test in the project. So let me try that one more time. Okay, so now it's invoking pester and running our uh, test for plaster, and it's giving us output in this output window. Um, but this kind of sucks because this output window doesn't show colorized output, and pester has a lot of nice color output. You kind of want to see that. But also, it doesn't show new lines correctly. I don't know what's going on with that, but it's like everything seems jammed together. So, you know, it's nice to be able to have your test output in the editor, but um, some people would like to have a more, you know, traditional experience with that. So. Um, more recently, I think within the last two versions, they updated the task system to allow you to run tasks, tasks inside of the integrated terminal. So it will actually launch PowerShell in the integrated terminal and then run them there so you see the output as it's meant to be seen. So to get that to work, you need to change the version in your task.json file to 2.0. And once you save that, it's going to ask you to restart VS Code because it has to switch out its task engine. So I'll reload the window again. And now when I run my test task, it pops up a terminal and it gives this error, which I'm not really sure why this is coming up. This is a thing other people have seen too. But now you see that it's running Pester and you're getting like the progress bars, you're getting all the colored output and everything. Um, it's just generally better for running PowerShell tasks because you get like the actual console experience. Now this terminal that it pops up is not interactive. It's just purely for the purpose of showing output from a task. Um, so you'll see that you still have the well, if I open a PowerShell file, there's still the separate PowerShell integrated terminal or integ integrated console that is separate from that. So this is a different session than the one that you're using in the editor. So um, so that's pretty much it for tasks. Any questions on, on tasks at the moment? Any other questions? I'm sorry? Yeah. <clears throat> Anything specific there that you'd like to know about? Yeah, we're just running, we're just, we're just calling out to a, a command on the system and, and letting it take care of everything, which is pretty nice. All right, so configuring PS Script Analyzer. So uh, I'm, how many people have used PS Script Analyzer in the past? Okay, well, it's a, a really nice project that uh, gives you rule-based analysis on PowerShell scripts and modules um, and DSC resources to give you indications when something that you're doing sort of violates best practices or might be risky from a security perspective. Um, we have a lot of built-in rules that are available and we've uh, taken Script Analyzer and plugged it into VS Code so that you get these rules uh, marking your code whenever you're uh, developing it. So interactively you're seeing these rules uh, light up in your editor. Um, by default, we use a small set of the rules because uh, if you show all the rules, then it just gets a little bit crazy and your code's marked up everywhere. Nobody really wants that. So we start with a small set of rules for the most common things that people care about. And then uh, we allow you to configure those rules using a PS Script Analyzer settings file. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. I think I might jump back to that new project that we created to show this. All right, so um, generally what you, you'll want to do is create a PSD1 file called psscriptanalyzersettings.psd1. And uh, this file has, a, has an expected format. And if you go look at the script analyzer documentation, it tells you exactly what you need to do for that. Let's see if it loads. All right. All right, so... Uh, this gives us information about how we can set up a settings file. So what I'll do is just steal one of these little configuration blocks to put in my settings file. And uh, currently it's only configured to have two rules active. And uh, I'll go ahead and change the first one to PS avoid uh, using aliases. I believe that's the name of the rule. So if I go into uh, my settings file, I also need to configure the editor to know about the settings file. So I'll use the PowerShell script analyzer, or script analysis settings path. 
and I'll say PS script analyzer settings.psd1. Okay. So now if I go into my module and I type GCI, which is an alias, ah, I need to reload the session. So I think sometimes you have to restart the session whenever you change the settings file because uh, we don't watch that file for changes, so you need to uh, reload the editor for it to work. Oh, and I may have actually used the wrong name for that. Let me check one other file real quick. Avoid using aliases. I'm not sure why it's not loading right now. Make sure I didn't make any typos. PS script analyzer settings at PSD1. It's interesting. All right, let me load up a different project that I know this works in. So I'll type uh, GCI, C. This is really going to make me look like a fool today, isn't it? All right, we'll skip that one for now. I don't know why that's not working. But uh, so uh, generally, we have the, that rule uh, added by default because it's pretty useful. Uh, the nice thing about it is um, when you violate certain rules like the aliases rule, um, it will give you a little green squiggle under, under uh, the alias, and when you click on that part where it has a squiggle, it will show a little light bulb in the side to suggest a change that will uh, fix what your violation is. So in the case of aliases, it will replace the alias with the actual name of the, of the function. Um, this is some general functionality we have in Script Analyzer where we have um, rules that have corrections. So if you think that's kind of interesting, like to be able to fix your code based on rule violations, then um, you should definitely let us know if you think of any other possibilities for things that we could fix automatically in code, because um, we can add that to any of our rules. So if you go to the PS Script Analyzer, PS Script Analyzer repo uh, in the PowerShell organization, uh, this repo, you will be able to uh, give us feedback on that. Uh, any questions on Script Analyzer? Yeah. Yeah, there's actually documentation for all the rules. Uh, if you go to the rule documentation folder inside of the, the repo, then there's markdown files for every one of the rules. It tells you what the rule does, what the parameters of the rule are, that sort of thing, um, so that you can set those in your settings. Um, I don't know if this is going to work right now because it's not playing nice, but uh, one of the interesting things that you can do if you're doing cross-platform module development um, is you can use a script analyzer rule that um, checks for compatibility for commands that are that you're using in your scripts to see whether they're available on uh, Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Um, if I try to type get service right now, let's see if it actually works. Yeah, okay, so I've got this rule configured called uh, PS use compatible commandlets, and I've configured it to check, check for compatibility with uh, PowerShell Core 6 uh, on Linux. And it tells me here that I'm using get service, but uh, Git service is not compatible with PowerShell core on version 6 on Linux because that command is not available there. So this is like the first step in being able to tell you while you're developing your code whether your code is compatible on other platforms. Um, this doesn't work for .NET APIs yet. We need to add some more uh, functionality in Script Analyzer to, to do this, but it's kind of the first step in letting you know that maybe you have some compatibility issues. Any other questions on Script Analyzer? Script Analyzer? All right. All right, script formatting. I think we're getting pretty close to running out of time, so I'll try to rush through this a little bit. Uh, we added script, what's that? Oh, great, okay. So uh, we added uh, support for code formatting for PowerShell and VS Code probably about three, three versions ago. 
Uh, in the first release, it, uh, it did pretty good, but then it also broke some stuff like uh, Magic for Reach and uh, some other things like that. But we've quickly been fixing a lot of these issues, and I think that the, the code formatting is at a point now where it's pretty reliable. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that this, is, this code formatting is provided by script analyzers. So you can run the same code, code formatting rules on your code in your repo or in your CI system to say whether the code that's in the repo conforms to your, your, code, for, your code format guidelines. So if you want to enforce that your project conforms to a specific coding standard, uh, you can do that with Script Analyzer. Now, Script Analyzer, Script Analyzer doesn't have the functionality yet to automatically fix all of the formatting in your files. We need to add that still, but uh, currently VS Code is the only place where the, um, the rules can be applied um, to fix the formatting. So I'll show you how to do that right now. Actually, I realize I haven't set up a good example of this, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. So let's say, for instance, uh, I type my function. So I got everything just crammed together on one line. Um, if I run the format document uh, command, which is shift alt F, it will at least put a space in here. Um, I think it also if I configure it, let's actually check out the, the configuration settings. Um, I'll open my settings, settings, excuse me, settings.json file. Actually, let's use the settings UI because it's a little bit easier to manage. So I can search for code formatting here, and it gives me all of the PowerShell code formatting settings. And you can basically configure this to taste. If you like to have your opening curly bracket on the same line or on the next line, you can you can set that here. Uh, we, we deal with pretty much all of the um, common community standards for uh, code formatting. So you should be able to set this up in a way that makes sense for your project. So let's say we want to have new line after open brace. It's interesting because that should have worked, but I think that there's another setting that keeps everything on the same line. So let me, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, that we have a, a rule that also allows you to keep like single line expressions on one line. So that's probably why this one didn't, didn't get expanded. But let's say someone goes and does your, their function the wrong way with the, uh, what's that? Ignore one block, ignore one line block is, uh, is the one. We'll show that one a little bit later. But uh, if I run the, the code formatter with a shift alt F, then it puts that bracket back up on the same line as the function definition. And uh, you can also say that you want to have the, uh, the new line after close brace, set that to false save the settings and then if I run this again oh I think that's changed the wrong setting yeah that's a close brace is that the right one ah yeah, that's, that's sort of the problem we have a lot of settings here and it's sometimes confusing open brace on same line let's change that to false all right Cool, so shift alt, shift alt F caused the, the brace to go onto the next line. So this can work basically across your whole project. So if you have like a, a, a lot of code in one file, you can change the formatting really easily um, to, uh, to, to conform to those standards. Uh, it's really good for like, if you're inheriting some code from somebody and it's just like haphazardly formatted or maybe multiple people worked on it and it's like inconsistent, you can run this on the code and it will uh, make it all pretty again. Um, another cool thing is you can do formatting of just like a specific section of the code. So if I only want to format this block and not the entire file, um, let's see, is that control K, control F. So control K, control F. Oh, that's not right. Let's, let's run it from the command palette. So format selection. Why did that not work? Man, this is just not going well for me today, is it? Anyway, the idea is that you should be able to format a selection rather than formatting the entire document. Um, also, you can do a really cool thing where it will format your code as you type it. So if I turn on the, uh, the format on type setting, the format, format on type, turn that to true, then whenever I'm typing in my file, if I press enter, it will uh, drop that uh, brace down to the next line. So I'll do that one more time because it was confusing. So if I press enter here, 
then it reformats that code right as I press enter. So usually it takes like pressing enter or doing something to cause the formatting to happen. It's not going to like reformat your code every letter that you type. So it's, it does it in a reasonable way. So um, it's kind of nice for, you know, making sure that your code is properly formatted as you're working on it and not having to do something after the fact. But if you don't want to, it to format while you type, but you want it to format whenever you save the file, there's also a setting for that. So you can change this to format on save. And what it'll do is if, uh, if I have this set up and I hit control S to save the file, it will format the file just before it saves it. So if someone is working in your project and you've got your workspace settings set up like I do to have specific formatting settings turned on, whenever they edit code in your project and save it, VS Code is gonna format their code to your standards. So this is a really cool way to enforce coding standards whenever you're you know, contributing to the same project on GitHub. Um, someone clones your code and they have no choice. Now you've got it set so that uh, they have to follow your style. So. What's that? Yeah, there's a, there's a setting for that that's separate to the formatting, which you can do that with, yeah. So, so that's that's nice to have. There's also some cool stuff like uh, from the editor itself, like trim trailing white space. Like if you hate it whenever there's white extra white space at the end of the line because in your Git diffs it gives you that big red block, then you can make that not happen anymore because it will trim those off whenever the file gets saved. So uh, pretty pretty helpful. Any other questions about code formatting? Yeah, yeah. But any any nested structures is going to format it the same way. Um, another interesting thing that we just added that hasn't been shipped yet, but it will be shipped probably next week, is if you're writing a DSC configuration and you like to have your uh, DSC values lined up on the same column, then we've got a new formatting rule that will allow you to line up all those equal signs whenever you're setting that up. Also works for hash tables. So if you like to have hash tables kind of nicely formatted, um, that'll be automatic as well. And it works with nested hash tables. So that's pretty cool. Any other questions about good formatting? Yep. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, all right, let's talk about that for a second. So uh, one of the big limitations in VS Code at the moment is that um, code folding does not work at the language level. It works only at a very naive indentation level implementation. And this is a problem because uh, region tags in uh, PowerShell don't indent. They're all in the same line as the rest of the code. So the for, the current folding system does not know how to fold those because there's no indentation inside of the, the region block. Um, this is really going to require them to have a little bit deeper understanding of the structure of the language for every language that is supported in an editor. So you can kind of guess that this is a lot of work and I think they're um, they have other priorities at the moment. Uh, they haven't really uh, committed to working on that yet but uh, it's good to keep telling the team, hey, we need to have region folding. Anytime anybody asks me about it, I send them to this one issue on the VS Code repo. And because I have told people so many times, I think I remember the issue ID. Uh, let's see, issues, oh, it's already here. It's a 3422. If you go to this issue, there's like 100 comments, people saying, please add this now. And uh, yeah. Just, just keep bugging them because this is really important. You can see there's 120 upvotes and a lot of people have been talking here. And most of the people commenting here are PowerShell users who are like, why the hell doesn't region folding work? Um, it it kind of makes me feel bad because when I see people demo code at conferences, a lot of people use regions so that they don't expose the code later in the script yet. They want to like, you know, progressively show you things in the code while they're uh, doing their, their presentation. So to me, it's, it's a really important issue. Um, but I've got a lot of my own work to do, so I haven't had a chance to go and like help them fix this. I think it's going to take quite a lot of work, so hopefully sometime this year we'll be able to, to make some progress on that. But uh, for now, uh, we're just stuck with the, the, the lame half implementation. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, developing cross-platform binary modules. Um, there's not really like a full story for this yet, but I can show you what's possible at the moment if you want to set it up yourself. Um, because we have the, the new .NET SDK that has the ability to build both full CLR and core CLR applications and uh, libraries, uh, we can use this command line tool to build PowerShell modules that work both in Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core. You have to build separate 
builds of those modules right now because there's not a way to build a single module that works in both. This is sort of a limitation of the .NET framework. Hopefully .NET Standard 2.0 will take care of that, but we're still sort of like evaluating whether this is gonna be possible. Uh, until then, um, what you can do in VS Code is have a build script that knows how to invoke the .NET SDK, the command line tools, to build your uh, C-sharp source for your binary module, uh, both for Windows PowerShell and uh, PowerShell Core, and then you know, do all the necessary work to package it up and make it usable as a module. You can also do debugging of the binary components uh, using the C-sharp extension in VS Code. So um, you can do some level of debugging of both you know, the PowerShell side and C-sharp. It's not super easy at the moment, but um, we'll do a little bit of work later this year to make it where you can do everything at once. You can step through from PowerShell code directly into a .NET library and, and back and forth. So that'll be pretty cool whenever it happens. But for now, I'll just show you how you can do it uh, kind of manually. So let me close this other window. And I'll open up the Phosphor project since it has a binary component. Okay, so I have, um, so, so for those of you who didn't attend the Phosphor session, Phosphor is a, a module that allows you to automatically generate user interfaces from, uh, from PowerShell modules. Uh, it, it's built on a uh, core binary module that has a REST API hosted from within it. So maybe I want to debug requests to that REST API from running from within PowerShell. So I've got my modules controller.cs file here. I put a breakpoint in, and then um, I can load PowerShell in a separate application. Uh, let me see if I can make that bigger. Probably doesn't matter that much. And um, I need to get the process ID since I need to attach to this process. Since I'm not, I'm not running it from within VS Code, I'm running it separately and I need to attach to the process. So I'll run the show module command, which then starts this REST API in the background and then pops up a window. And uh, now I'll run the debugger for uh, .NET full attach. So there's two different modes for debugging full CLR uh, binaries and core CLR binaries. So I'm gonna run the uh, full CLR version. And since I know the, the process ID is uh, 25912, I can just type that out, uh, 25912, and I can find PowerShell here. So now I've attached to PowerShell, which has my binary loaded inside of it. And now if I go back to the UI, um, and I do something in the UI that causes that REST service to be hit. I type like process, and if you didn't come to the Phosphor talk, shame on you. Um, so I'll click, click process here, and now you'll see that VS Code has a notification, and I'm now debugging the, the binary component that's inside of PowerShell that's running for my module. So you can do the same thing. <laughs> So you can step through the code, the same thing as uh, you do with PowerShell code. It's, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, so that, that you know, makes it really easy. If you really want to do like hardcore C-sharp development in PowerShell, you can do it. Uh, oh no, I, I, I skipped that part, but I'll, I'll show you uh, how that works. So um, like I was talking about with the task configurations before, I've got tasks configured for building uh, using my invoke build script. So you can look at the, how are we doing on time? Okay. So we're, we're just basically calling invoke build to build the module. Uh, I had the build command set up to build the module. So if I hit control shift B, uh, it'll show you that it's building um, the module using my build script. So um, yeah, it just builds all the binaries and then packages everything up. Uh, so yeah, you can build all your stuff from within power, uh, within VS Code, but it's actually invoking PowerShell to do everything on the command line. So I use the same build script on my CI server to build all the code and, and package it on the CI server as well. So it's kind of nice to be able to run your build scripts from within VS Code and not have to have any special you know extra stuff because you can use the same scripts on your CI server or just you know locally on the command line. Um, I think it's a really really nice way to do it. Um, let's see. I think that's everything for that one. So um, thinking ahead, um, we've done a lot of work to make 
uh, PowerShell development really good in VS Code, but there's even more we could do to make module development really good. Um, one thing that we might want to, to do, or one thing I'm really looking into in the near future is sort of standardizing the process of PowerShell module development, um, more in terms of like project structure, um, what tools we use to, to, to uh, deal with the development workflow, um, and trying to centralize all that using community tools, but you know, put it all in, orchestrate all that in one place, which I think Plaster might be the, the place to do that. So if you have uh, Plaster being like the project system for PowerShell module development, you can create a new module project from Plaster, and then Plaster can use other community tools like PS Depend or other other modules um, and, and build modules like Invoke Build, Sake, et cetera, to have a whole module development system that works both on the command line or in the editor, uh, like VS Code or any other editor. I mean, we have like a, a common set of tools that can be used in any PowerShell editor to have this, a consistent experience across all the editors. So you have the same level of experience and you know, you'll know you see that most Power, okay, not most, uh, newer PowerShell projects will start fo following the same format. So when you go around to different projects on GitHub, you'll understand the layout immediately. You'll know what you're looking at. And you'll also know that if you clone that repo and open it up in an editor that supports this tool chain, uh, it will just work like any other project that you're used to. So um, if you've used C Sharp, oh, sorry, if you've used Visual Studio for C Sharp development, everything's pretty much the same. I mean, you can customize it to taste, but you know, pretty much everyone uses the same kind of project structure and tooling. You know, it'd be nice to have a similar thing for PowerShell, but also make it available to use those tools from the command line or on your CI server, um, and, and just make it completely flexible, have everything be open source and, and the community be involved completely. Um, I think that's just kind of the right way to go. So. Um, I'm hoping to send out some some sort of like RFCs or specs, I guess, to the community within the next couple of months to discuss some of these ideas. So I really appreciate your feedback on those whenever they come out, because I think that um, we can definitely forge ahead a, like a, a new path where we have a really solid set of tooling for, for everyone to use. So in summary, um, currently we have a lot of really nice features for module development in VS Code. Um, they're becoming more and more integrated to the point where um, they, you, they have a really solid, consistent experience, um, you know, good for development, debugging, and testing of, uh, of modules and scripts, and D even DSE resources. I've been doing a lot of uh, DSE debugging recently, so that, that works pretty well too. But uh, we definitely need your continued feedback to keep making it better. And uh, you know, I like shipping often, so if you have feedback and you want something changed, just let me know and I'll try to get it done and ship it the next week or something, hopefully. Anyway, um, any questions uh, remaining? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any questions? Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Oh, whoop. One, one, one back here. Yep. Windows Store. I, I don't have any opinion on that right now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe that's something that's possible because uh, I think in general, the idea is that you should be able to ship Windows apps as uh, part of the Windows Store, but I haven't heard anybody talking about it, but, you know. Maybe that's something that people can do in the future. Yeah. So, one more. Yeah, I mean, there's a possibility that, that in the PowerShell extension, we could have like a configuration GUI to make it a little easier to get through uh, the settings. But I think once you kind of get used to the JSON configuration stuff, it actually makes a lot of sense. And it's nice because you can have this JSON file synced using like the settings sync uh, extension or like in a Git repo so that you can share them across your machine. So it's kind of better to have it just be in an easily editable JSON file. But, but yeah, I mean, if people really ask for it, then we'll look into trying to provide a GUI for editing configuration settings in the editor. Uh, like, uh, like which, uh, well, they have the same thing where it's like a, uh, yeah, yeah, right. So it's basically the same. So you have a configuration file, and the editor gives you some hints in the configuration file for things you can set, but it's just a text file, basically. I think Vim is similar to that also. Uh, like a, like a, the little pop-up boxes and stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's possible we could have like an initial setup wizard that the first time you install the extension, we ask you some questions about like what your preferences are, and then we can figure them for you. So that's certainly a possibility. I've thought about that in the past too. Yep. All right, we're, we're done now. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.